Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for joining me again for another Frequently Asked Questions about Honeybees. This is basic beekeeping information for beginners. Today is Friday the 15th and uh, this is Frequently Asked Questions number 8. So thanks for coming again. If you're new, I invite you to go ahead, if you come up with questions of your own regarding honeybees, go ahead and write them down in the video description. As you can see in the beginning sequence of this video, it's still bad outside. Yesterday we had uh, temps that went all the way up to almost 70 degrees. The bees were flying, everything was going right. And another thing that's weird, my bees were bringing in pollen. And I don't mean a lot of it, but like every 15th to 20th bee that was coming back to the beehive and hitting the landing board had pollen on its legs. Pale to light yellow pollen. Where they're finding that, I have no idea. It's March 15th, it's still cold outside. Today it's only in the low 40s, and as you can see, my chickens were out scrounging around, and I gave a quick pan through uh, one row of beehives, and as you can see, not a single bee is flying. Yesterday, the sky was alive with the bees. So actually, you know, we can get excited about bees this time of year and think, wow, they really made it. All of them came through winter, and it's outstanding. It's great. Actually, they're at greater risk now than at any other time of the year, in my opinion, and that's because we get that warm up and the bees start flying. Queens are laying. If they, if they haven't started laying already, they're doing it now. And so there's brood in there and the bees need resources more than ever to keep the brood going. And uh, what's going to happen? We have snow forecasts again. So coming up tomorrow and the next day, we have snow, rain, temps in the low 30s. It's going to drop below freezing and those bees are going to be challenged again. So it happens very often that we get a false sense of confidence with the bees and uh, we think they're doing great and we're already, you know, planning this great year of bee rearing ahead and we think they're super healthy and then all of a sudden we have hives that die out. In fact, uh, my wife came up to me earlier in the week and said, uh, it looks like the bee, you had a massive die off on your favorite beehive, they're all dead. And uh, because there were a lot of dead bees in front of the hive. And uh, so I wasn't very happy to hear that because it's a hive that I want to work with. And I went out there and I called my wife back out to the apiary and I said, is this the hive you're talking about? And it's the one that I have four boxes high. It was full of honey and everything else going into fall. And it's a, it's a hive I plan on working with this year a lot because they're survivor line bees. And I invited her to come up and put her head up against the side of it because you look at the landing board and there's nothing on the landing board but a few dead bees in the grass in front of it dead bees everywhere by the hundreds and uh, you can look across the apiary and there's another colony where the bees are flying so they're doing cleansing flights but this hive appears outwardly to be dead but when she put her head up against the side of the colony and look at the third box up of a four box high uh, hive, uh, it sounded like someone left the ventilation on in there. You could hear it. So not only are they alive in there, but it's a large colony of bees. Because if you can put your head on there and it's a dead and you hear that humming sound and we didn't knock on it, we didn't do the, the rap test to see if we could agitate them because sometimes you'll get a surge of sound and then it'll taper off again. These guys are ventilating in there the whole time. So that tells me they're on brood because just a torpor cluster, they don't fan their wings. They don't cycle the air. But if they're on a brood frame where the baby bees are being developed, they do fan the air because they're keeping fresh oxygen over the surface because the caps on brood are porous so that those developing pupae can breathe. And uh, so we know a lot is going on there and I have high expectations still, but the cautionary tale is that you think a hive is dead when it isn't. You think a hive is doing great when it may not be. So when they're all out foraging, don't get a false sense of confidence. Now, if you're in the South, you already know what you're dealing with. But up here in the Northeastern United States, we don't know what the bees are doing yet. I don't know if they're, if they're as good as they seem. They could die off. We're going to have a beekeeper meeting next week. And I know everybody's going to give their bee counts. And they're going to say how many colonies they lost and how many survived. And uh, we always make that mistake of claiming a, a hive died when it didn't because it just magically comes to life later. And, um, you know, hives that we think are thriving, doing fantastic, just a couple weeks of rain. And next thing you know, they're all nose into the cells and uh, starving out. 
So by the way, this is a time to make sure you put feet on. I'm going to cover that in another question here, but uh, I just wanted to give a little background on what's going on in my area. Uh, we're not out of the woods. We have lots of bad weather coming and the bees are still going to be challenged because now, although they're finding, they're finding pollen, I don't know where they're getting it because it's too early for the maple trees. We already know that the uh, willow trees, we have a lot of wetlands near us. We couldn't see any floral sources of any kind, but the bees are finding it, so they are really doing great. So we're gonna get right into the frequently asked questions. Spirit Bear, Spirit Bear 12. Very first question that came out. Uh, during winter, can we put the bees in a greenhouse? Bees could fly and eliminate or just attach the greenhouse to the hive entrance. And the reason this comes up is because I recently put out a video that showed the bees doing cleansing flights, landing in the snow, and uh, I personally was not picking up bees and putting them back on landing boards uh, and trying to get them out of the cold and out of danger and back to the hive. And that's because when they do their cleansing flights, sometimes those bees have no intention of coming back. Other times, as others have pointed out, they may be completely surprised by the cold because these are new bees that have hatched out over winter. And uh, when they fly out, uh, it may be warm enough and then all of a sudden they hit a cold snap and they fall to the ground. Now, should you be picking those up and putting them back? And it, it probably doesn't hurt to put them back because if they're on the landing board and they don't want to go back, they're going to fly off the landing board again, which happens frequently. The other thing is some of the guard bees that are at the entrance of your hive will reject those bees also. They're doing cleansing flights and that means that uh, they hold their waste material in their body while they're inside the hive. And the point is not to contaminate the hive. Uh, there are illnesses, it's just like bee diarrhea, that uh, they can have um, bacteria infections and things that will cause them to eliminate and then it spreads that bacteria. So to save the colony, the bees fly out, eliminate, and that's where you see little tan spots in the snow and things like that. So some of them did take off and did make it back to their colonies. So then the question comes, and this, this happens a lot, can't we put that beehive in or adjacent to some kind of structure that would allow the bees to do those cleansing flights and return to the colony without being frozen and without dying. So a cleansing flight doesn't have to be a one-way event. So I don't have any personal experience with greenhouses with bees. So, and, and we do have beekeeper friends that are putting bees inside sheds and things like that. And there are parts of the world where the entire beehive is inside a building the only thing that is exposed to the element would be the front of the beehive. But that does not aid the cleansing flight safety because even though the hive itself is shielded and it might be kept warm, just like observation hives are. Observation hives are inside buildings. The climate inside the building is the temperature of the colony as well. And so they use much less energy to keep that warm. But when they fly out, they go outside, no matter what structure they're kept in, they are exposed to the cold. So Spirit Bear is probably thinking that that flight that they take, if we provided another space for that. So if you had a tube coming out of your beehives in winter that went straight into a, a greenhouse or something that was warm enough that they could sustain themselves long enough to fly out, eliminate, and come back, or could we provide them basically with an outhouse? I think it's a good idea. If anyone is doing something like that or has done something like that where they provided a, a barn or some big space for the bees to do flights and return, I know that people that have warehoused beehives uh, just go out there and find that they have wall-to-wall -wall dead bees on the concrete of their warehouse. So that hasn't really proven out. So if someone has done that, please put your information down in the comment section. It would be interesting. Provide a link if you've got a video about it or if you find a video about people keeping bees completely contained. Uh, there, the other question that comes up is can we keep bees in greenhouses, period, and uh, have them pollinate the plants inside a greenhouse? There just isn't a greenhouse big enough to provide enough plants to sustain a colony of bees. So if you wanted to completely enclose bees keep them exclusively in a greenhouse. You might get away with that with some of the solitary bees, some of the orchard bees, uh, minor bees, things like that. You know, uh, you might get away with something like that, but not Apis mellifera, not the, uh, the number of bees that we're talking about in a beehive. So that's an interesting thing. You know, could we do it? 
I'd like to know if somebody did, if you have a greenhouse and you've thought about just having a winter tube going from your beehive into the greenhouse so that they could do their cleansing flights inside in safety and security and warm enough to fly back, then that would be an interesting study. I just don't have any personal information, but I would like to get information from those watching who, who might have found something like that. So thank you for that question. It's an interesting one. And the next one is Matthew Sweeney. Culling old frames, are you reclaiming the wax and refurbishing the frames? So when we talk about old frames, we're talking about the, the generally the brood box is where the frames get the oldest, the fastest. And that's because the cells in the brood become very fibrous. Also, we get that black, really dark umber colored frame and the comb itself. So then if we pull out the comb and it's really old, what are we going to do with it? Do we reuse the frames? Now you know that uh, if you've watched any of my other videos, I use a lot of the one-piece plastic frames. Years ago I used to use the Pirico, now I use acorn frames. They've been around for a long time. In fact, the guy that developed acorn frames used to work with Pirco, so we're talking about kind of sister companies. And uh, those frames almost never wear out. So they're not exposed to the sun, they don't have UV damage, they are PVA free, uh, food grade plastic. So those are worth reusing and have a power washer. So for example, if you had a, a colony of bees that totally died out and you had wax moths in there and they put their webbing all over everything, that is a huge mess. And even scraping off old uh, brood comb is very fibrous and it doesn't scrape away clean just as a regular wax frame would. So I do recycle the frames as long as they're in good condition. The wooden frames tend to, I do have some wood frames that are nine or 10 years old and they're covered in propolis by now. And uh, the bees do go after those and draw them out again right away. So if they're strong and sturdy, I keep them. Uh, some people have concerns that wood grain frames have an open porous material that could house bacteria. But the whole purpose, remember, of the bees propolizing everything is to contain and reduce bacteria. So propolis is antibacterial and uh, they do seal up old wood. In fact, if you have old inner covers and things like that, you'll see that the whole thing is tan and uh, umber colored with propolis. So if they're physically solid, you can reuse them. What I like to do with really old comb because I cycle them out every other frame. I don't do an all out and all in kind of thing. So every other frame will be a new frame. When I pull the old frames, those are what I use for swarm traps. So it's a good way to recycle the old frames with comb in them. And that's because uh, you don't care about it anyway. So if, if a swarm tap, trap gets put out and uh, it gets taken over by wax moths or something like that, and wax worms start eating up all that, uh, that uh, wax in there, then you haven't really lost anything. Those were frames you're going to throw out anyway, but they are very appealing to uh, foraging scouts that are looking for places to live if you're trying to catch a swarm. So I recommend using old frames in swarm traps. And that leads me to another thing I wanted to mention. Early in the year, people are gonna be dealing with swarms, they're gonna to try to catch them. And I've been really lucky with swarms. I've had, you know, just bee boxes sitting around that uh, swarms have just moved into on their own. I collect my own bees that swarm on trees in my apiary in the area around my house. Uh, but there is something called Swarm Commander. If you're looking for lures for swarms, a lot of people use lemongrass and things like that. Uh, premium Swarm Lure, Swarm Commander. I have this stuff. And uh, so aside from using the old comb and using used equipment, the boxes that have been occupied by bees are great lures because they smell right and they've been occupied and there's already propolis in there and it will be appealing to bees. I've had the same boxes get occupied year after year uh, by swarms. And this stuff you spray on the inner cover just a little bit on the, uh, the backs of some of the frames in there and that will entice the scouts to check it out and then they'll measure it out by walking the space inside and make sure that your swarm box is out there, it's weatherproof and the landing board, you can do a couple spritzes on the landing board and then you would refresh that uh, once a week or so. And uh, the bees hopefully will find it and move in. Put your box in a sheltered area where bees would naturally seek a place to live. Sometimes I'll just have an empty box sitting right in the apiary and they magically, one day you walk out there and it's occupied by bees. And I used to think, wow, they're robbing out that uh, colony, but they're not. They're cleaning it up. 
If bees are cleaning it up and dragging out dead bees and things like that, you know that you've got a swarm that's moving in. So I use old frames for swarm material. Uh, the other thing is when it gets time and, and it's, let's say it's totally not usable, you have to clean the wax and everything off. So again, the power sprayer, if you're going to recycle the plastics, they won't accept those for recycling if they have organic material on them. So you have to power spray off all the remnants and that works pretty good. And then just put them all in a bag by themselves. So just your Pierco or acorn frames in a, in a bag by themselves for recycle. Don't mix it up with, you know, milk jugs and things like that. So they're recyclable as well. So that's what I do with my old frames. I pull them, get them out. And of course, up in the supers where you're gonna collect honey, you want the best wax possible up there. I also pull those sometimes and put them right into my solar wax melter. Solar wax melter for me is nothing but an old deep 10 frame box stacked on another 10 frame box. So it's too high, put plate glass on the top, tip it up so it faces the sun. The interior surfaces are painted black and then there's a window screen in the bottom and that catches uh, particulates and stuff out of the wax. The wax melts through that and then collects in a tin down below and it's very primitive and that's just what I do. I hang the old frames in there then once the wax is melted off, if it's a wooden frame I might reuse it. If not, that's when I throw it all away. And you can't harvest honey out of that because it gets so hot in there the honey really turns into molasses and it's not good for anything. So that's what I do. Next is from Clive Williams. Clive says, and he's from the UK, uh, they had a two week warm up and the bees were flying, bringing in pollen and nectar and the weather turned cold again. Bees stopped flying. Will they be able to reduce moisture enough not to cause condensation problems? So the condensation problems that I've seen in my hives here in the United States uh, generally happens when we have those cold, really cold days and then we have a warm up. So what happens is the outside of the hive starts to warm up really fast and then we have parts of the hive inside that attract condensation because their surfaces are cold, especially up in the honey stores that the bees are not directly on top of. Those are the temperature of the outside. So when you get an immediate warm up, there's condensation and sometimes you'll see mold and uh, you'll even get chalk brood sometimes. So we wanna make sure that, that the hives are well ventilated at this time of year. But I've only seen those problems when the population of the colony was low. So I've never found chalk brood in a hive that was well populated and that were healthy. It sounds like these bees are doing great because they're bringing in pollen and they're bringing in nectar already. So they're already working on their resources. So a cold snap that isn't sustained shouldn't be really hard on those bees in my opinion. They actually use the condensation that shows up. They're gonna keep it clean in fact, uh, bees, once they catch up and once the population builds again, you'll see they'll actually take frames that have some kind of, you'll see it look kind of white moldy, white chalky surface on your frames. They'll clean that up and chew off bits and pieces and get rid of them. And then you'll see them building new comb on top of that. So in my opinion, that's not that big of a deal unless you have a sustained cold period and they can't get back out to get the pollen and resources that they need to take care of the new brew that they must be caring for. To me, that's much more of a concern than the condensation itself. So ventilation without drafting is gonna take care of most of the condensation. So I wouldn't worry huge about that. It sounds like they're doing great. Next is, now I don't know how to say this name, Jackal or Jakul, J-A-C-K-U-U-L. Is it better to be more hands-on so they get used to you daily, weekly, or monthly inspections. This is something that comes up a lot with new beekeepers. They just want to see what's going on in that beehive, so they always want to pull off the lid and get in there and check it out. That works against the bees. So as far as the bees getting used to you or, or, or accustomed to you being around them, I spend a pile of time out by my bees. That doesn't mean I'm pulling the lid and taking off boxes and pulling frames to look at them. Uh, because that's highly disruptive. So what I am doing is I'm, I'm sitting right next to the hive, not directly in front of the landing board, try not to be in their flyway. Although when I'm making videos, it's what I do. But uh, I spent a lot of time sitting out there just drinking coffee, sitting in the sun and watching to see what they're doing and how healthy the bees are coming and going. And I also pay attention when they're dragging a dead bee out because I try to get a hold of that so I can get a look at it. 
you can learn a lot about the health of your colony and what's going on in there just by landing board observations. Now that doesn't mean you should never get inside a beehive and look at them. You should. Because you're going to want to see what's going on in the brood. You're going to want to make sure your queen is good and that she's laying and that everything's fine. But if you see a strong population of bees and everything's calm and productivity is normal and you know there are plenty of guard bees and things like that and the hive is clean, the landing board's clean, you've got a healthy colony already. So now, so what's the drawback? Why can't you just get in there every week and look at them? Some people get a, a new package of bees or they get a new nucleus of bees and they put those in and the next thing they want to do is they want to check on that right away. Those bees are getting used to their environment and uh, they don't like disruption. You're really not an invited guest when you're opening up a beehive and looking at the colony contents. And if you do that a lot with a newly, catched, newly collected swarm, or if you start inspecting a lot on a new package install, you can actually inspire those bees to swarm out. They don't like to be bothered. So what should you be checking on? If they're brand new and you just put a queen in there and she's in her queen cage, and this queen cage is in there and uh, you put this candy side up so that the queen can get out even if the little worker bees die in there, they're with her. Uh, you can check that three days after you've installed the queen. Then once you see that she's out of the cage, you can leave this in there for a while or you can remove the cage. It really doesn't matter. The bees don't care. But you also want to know that the queen got out and that she made it. If she's lying in this cage and she's dead, then you know you better have another queen because that means she was rejected and stung to death by the workers in that colony. On the flip side, if they're trying to feed her through the screen and she's still in there when you open it, you can actually release her. You can pry the screen right off the face of this and let that queen go right into the colony because she's already being fed and she has a group of workers that are accepting her. But uh, people that just like to check every day and see how they're doing and check on the bees, you're going to be doing more harm than good. And that does not improve your standing with the bees, so you're not making friends with them. But uh, bees, bees do tend to put up with some people more than others. I can be out in the apiary for hours on end with a cup of coffee and just staring at them and seeing what's going on and nothing ever happens. And my wife can walk out there in the first five minutes, she's got to be in her hair and that uh, starts stinging her. So I don't know what's going on. Now, do they recognize individuals? I don't know, maybe it's conduct too. Maybe it's the way you smell. So uh, the more hands-on you are, the worse it is for the bees. And again, I'll go back to my observations in the observation hive. I did not realize until I was able to look through the glass and see what bees do day by day, how much time they spend building infrastructure between the frames. So when we have uh, deep frames and you have another box of frames directly over the top, they are connecting all of that together. And what they're doing is they're spreading propolis and they're also doing what we refer to as burr comb. And often between the frames, you'll see that they raise drones as well. So you get larger cells that accommodate drones. Uh, they spend a lot of time building that wax and shaping everything and establishing it so they, they have great corridors to pass through to get through the hive efficiently. They also shape the uh, airflow of the hive with their uh, honeycomb. So each time, you know, you get your hive tool out, do to do, and you open up the hive, you pry off that inner cover, look at the inner cover. Look at all the work that's on that thing. That's an inner cover. This little bee space, the darker stuff is propolis. The light stuff is beeswax. Look at the shape of it. If this were kept connected, these are little pathways and corridors that the bees made. And then of course, this is a big path-through hole that they did not try to close. But all this work gets disrupted every time you pry this off. And most people scrape this off. And I carry a stainless steel bucket with me. And I scrape off burr comb and I put it in there. Also, I have boxes going on this year that have feeders in them and it's a four inch high space at the top of the hive that I'm going to use to collect uh, burr comb with honey in it. It's going to be part of my chunk honey collection. So they do build comb in all these open spaces and every time you tear apart their boxes or pull the frames you're disrupting that and they have to restore and repair it. So I recommend getting inside your beehive as little as possible 
And you should only be doing that when you perceive that something might be wrong with the colony. I mean, you, you want to look at brood and things like that, but uh, you are not becoming better friends with your bees by getting into the hive more often and destroying their infrastructure. So I hope that answers that and keeping them. Okay. Next is St. Germain. The idea of not giving them too much space. If you have a nuke, would you recommend keeping them in the nuke until it's filled up? Okay, nuke is short for those who are watching that are new, and this is basic beekeeping. A nuke is just uh, an abbreviation for a nucleus colony. So the nucleus is where the bees are developing. The queen lays her eggs in a cell, the egg hatches, now it is larva, the larva is fed royal jelly, it gets to a certain maturity state, gets capped, now it's a pupa, and then the pupa are going to hatch out and you have new bees. So when you buy a nuke, you get a queen and then you get three to five full frames of brood. So those will be capped brood that will be hatching out and they will serve the queen in the new location where you're going to be in because they've never been out of the hive, they do really well. The whole purpose of that nucleus hive, which is a narrow hive body, so big, so wide, 20 inch long frames, whatever, okay, uh, that's to sell bees and queens, that's to transport bees and queens, and really not designed to start your colony with. So what I personally do, and again, you know, many beekeepers have their own successes and failures, they have their own methods, but because I'm not buying or selling nukes, you know, I'm not trying to start my own nucleus colony. So I go straight into, at the smallest, an eight frame box. And then I just take those three to five frames, they become the center frames of the box. And then the remaining frames are for them to expand out into, put an inner cover on it, top cover, and then on a landing board. And I leave that until it gets filled up. So uh, is that too much space for them? I don't think so, because you control what's going on as far as their ability to defend that colony by putting an entrance reducer on. So when you have a new colony, whether it's a swarm, nukes, or packaged bees, you want to have your entrance reducer on and a narrow entrance so that those bees can get established and can defend without being robbed out. And you will see them flying almost immediately because as those nucleus cells hatch out, uh, those bees are going to go to nursing duties, but they're going to go straight to work because the queen hasn't even begun to lay yet. So in general, she, you may already have eggs and open brood and everything else. Uh, so then they'll start filling up and they should explode because you should be buying in a nuke or packaged bees at a time when there is a lot of support for them in the environment. So the pollen and nectar resources should be at a high. You should be starting out at a time when they have their best chances, of course, not during a dearth, not midsummer, not at the end of the year. That's a terrible time to be buying uh, a nuke. So you should be starting in spring and they will expand and build rapidly. So I see no point once they've arrived at their final destination, which is you, then uh, I see no point in keeping them restricted to that uh, nucleus hive body. So instead, go with your eight frame, whatever your, the size of your hive is going to be, install them right into that, keep it as a single deep, and then as they build out, that's when you start adding supers on and let them expand. And if you don't keep up with them and expand in enough time, you can have a swarm. Even a tiny nuke left unto itself, uh, you're gonna be feeding them to get them started in case there are rainy days and things like that. You don't wanna lose your bees. So they can actually become populated very fast and actually leave that uh, box if it's too small. So you actually, a little more space is better at that time of year. The only time you really worry about all the extra space and their ability to keep up with that is when you go into uh, dearth periods and when you go into fall, when they're going to have to protect that area. They have to keep up with varroa mites, they have to keep the small hive beetles out, and they have to be able to clean it. So if you don't have a large enough population of bees in the box, they won't be able to keep up with housekeeping, let alone defend the colony. So you need room for expansion, and then at the end of the year, condense things down so there's not a lot of surplus space, so they can make the most of the resources that they have, and they have less work to do. 
So, would I recommend keeping them in the nuke until filled up? No, I recommend transferring them right away. Because the other thing is, uh, you're going to have to get into them again right away. So if you bought them in and you set them up and now you want to transfer them again later, more transportation, more disruption, more changes, pulling frames and putting them in. Buy your stuff. In fact, if you can, if you're going to pick up your nuke of bees, bring your box with you and have them just put those frames straight in your box and have the screen over the openings and have it cinched down really good so it doesn't come apart in transit. But put them in their final box right away. And then when you get them to where they're going to be, put them in their final position and location right away. Don't have an intermediate staging area where they start flying and try to sustain themselves and then you take them and move them again while you've, you've built up a stand or something like that. Have everything in place beforehand and make sure that, that when you get them home, you're going to put them right where they're going to be and as few transition, uh, transition opportunities that you have the fewer times you open, relocate, and mess with those bees, the better because they're trying to get situated, they're trying to get settled. So go ahead and put them right into your 8 or 10 frame box. Just my opinion, it's what I've always done. Okay, the number 6 here. This is by Merrick. When should I start feeding solid patties to my bees? Okay, so that, that term solid patties, uh, some people we're getting into that time of year where as the weather breaks and we know that we're not going to be freezing, uh, people like to put the protein patties on and Man Lake makes probably one of the top graded protein patties. And uh, you want to get the most expensive stuff, the best composition that you can possibly get. The thing of it is, don't put those patties on too soon because there's a high moisture content. So if you still have, as we do, snow in the forecast and rough weather in the forecast, uh, and they're going to be trapped inside that hive and they're not going to be able to get out and do cleansing flights, then stay with dry feed for now. Once the weather breaks and you know they will be able to fly out and do cleansing flights, then you can do, go to those protein patties because then when they have the moisture build up and everything and have had their bran muffins and their coffee, they can still get out and go to the bathroom and come back without messing up the interior of the hive. So when your weather breaks is when you're going to put the patties in. And then when it's warm for sure, that's when you can also make syrup available to them early in the year to get them started also. But don't provide anything that's got excess moisture in it, and those patties are. They, you know, they're doughy and there's moisture content there. So you want to feed dry feeds at this time. So you can put dry sugars and things like that. If you've got fondant in there, leave that for them, but that's just the sugar energy. The protein, the plant protein is gonna come from those protein patties. And again, Man Lake has created the top formula so far for those protein patties. Get their premium stuff. They have many grades of it. And the other thing is they also sell um, pollen substitute. So they also scored the highest in, in research studies uh, with their brood boosting pollen substitute that you can get. So that's a dry resource, but don't put that inside the hive. Let the foragers find it. Again, we don't want to kick off a bunch of brood before they're capable of uh, managing that. So anything that's got a high moisture content like those patties, don't put that on until the weather breaks and they'll be able to fly out and actually do cleansing flights. So if they can't do that, they're gonna be polluting their colony. So the other question that uh, Merrick had was, have you tried polyesterine beehives? You know, this is something that, that comes up a lot. People wanna know if I will test the uh, polyesterine hives and uh, they also want to know if I'll test the Apami, I may be mispronouncing that, but it's an all plastic beehive, Apami beehives, they're insulated, all the surfaces are plastic, and they have an expanded insulation inside. So, but we'll talk specifically about these polyesterine hives, which is polystyrene, however you want to call it. Uh, it's an expanded plastic material, and it's used a lot in shipping. And I want to tell you that uh, you know, I mean, that's a, it's a practical thing to think about. It's, it has a high R value. It's insulating the bees. The, the premise is, of course, that they're cooler in the summertime because they're insulated and they're warmer in winter because if they do need to heat up the interior space, they're insulated from the outside. That all sounds good on the face of it, but it is a polystyrene material. 
And uh, I do use it already. So I want to show you that. This is what polystyrene is. This is a hive cover. And this is kind of the same stuff that when you take carry out and stuff and it's, it's polystyrene. Um, but this is a higher density. So it's tough stuff. Now I throw these on top of my beehives for wintertime sometimes. And uh, it does insulate also for the summertime. It's white, it's reflective. But uh, guess what happens for me? This stuff is supposed to be recyclable because that's the other thing I'm concerned about. What do I do with this when it's no good anymore? Can I put this? It has a recycling class six on it here. But then guess what I found out? I can't uh, submit this with my recycling material because my city, the recycling department, does not accept polystyrene. So now what do you do with it? Well, it just goes to the landfill. Well, when it's in the landfill, guess how long this stuff takes to uh, decompose? The half-life of polystyrene is 500 years. So you have to kind of question and I already get questioned a lot because I use flow hives and I have flow frames. And there's plastics. Those are recyclable plastics and our recycling center does accept those. But they don't accept these. So I have to think about what's going to happen in the end of that. Could you just throw this on a fire and burn it? No, when this stuff burns, it releases toxins. If you're a firefighter and there's polystyrene burning, you have a toxic environment. So you can't burn it. It doesn't decompose. So we have a disposal problem with it where I live. Now where you live, you might have an area that accepts this stuff and, and grinds, recycles, and repurposes it. So that's one drawback to those polystyrene hives. The other thing is you have to paint this even though, I mean, it, it's supposed to be kind of weather resistant, but if you don't paint it, it will start to decompose. And for me personally, and you saw them at the beginning of the video, look at this really old one. And of course, yeah, I've used them because, I mean, who wouldn't want to insulate their chickens and cut down on condensation, insulate their chickens? Who wouldn't want to insulate their beehive and cut down on condensation inside the hive? So even though this one was painted, it still decomposed. And see these edges here? My chickens actually eat the stuff. So the chickens come along, they hop up on the hive next to this one, and they peck at this and they eat it. They eat every kind of insulation there is. So the other thing is, you know who else eats it? The bees. So if you can see this right here, the bees, the bees actually, this is propolis on it, but they actually were chewing holes in it. So the bees were chewing through this polystyrene. So once again, I don't know if that's good. There's no question. This is a fantastic insulator. So, you know, when people ask me, the ape of my hives, they look great. You know, I like the way they all clip together and everything. These polystyrene hives, uh, they're not, you can't even have polystyrene in uh, some parts of the country because they don't want it because of the fact that it, it pollutes, that it's unsafe when it burns, and that... Uh, you have no recycling for it. So these are areas where I kind of, you know, other than having these lids, I mean, by the way, they actually chewed a hole all the way through right to there. So the bees were, were chewing through it. That was pretty interesting. But uh, as an insulator, it's fantastic. As a material, if you're trying to be a responsible consumer, I know I have to tread lightly because obviously a company is marketing the polystyrene hives and it's the bottom board, it's the boxes, it's everything. But I have to say that just for me, I have no immediate plans to evaluate those or the Apomai hives, however that's pronounced, uh, just because they are 100% plastic material. So we always have to consider at the end of the reasonable use or lifespan of that material, what's going to happen to that when we're done? I do know that even when you paint it, uh, the polystyrene material breaks down in the sun. So, and my chickens eat it, so there's that. And the bees chew it from the inside. So, if you personally have great experiences with uh, polystyrene materials, uh, that's good for you, and I hope you live in a, a city where the recycling is advanced enough that they actually take those, you know, the popcorn packaging material and 
all the other stuff that's made out of polystyrene. I think even New York City, some of the bigger cities have uh, outlawed the the styrofoam cups and the styrofoam takeaway and fast food packaging. I don't eat fast food. I haven't had fast food for 19 years. And uh, so I don't, you know, even deal with throwing that stuff away or being a part of the system that consumes and tosses it. The eggs for my chickens are all in recycled paper material, so the cartons are not polystyrene. I think it's a material that we need to look at carefully before we consider, you know, how much of it we want to use, cast off, and put back into the environment. So if you have personal uh, experience with it, if you've got a website or a YouTube channel and, and you're using those hives, feel free to put that link down in our video description because, you know, I mean, I'll, I'll look at it and hear what's going on. Some people have also said that the polystyrene hives have some problems with condensation on the inside, which is weird because they're so well insulated. But because they don't breathe, uh, I guess there's problems with mold, and now they have to sell sanitizing products to spray down the surfaces to deal with that mold contamination. So again, there's just a number of layers. You know, if what I'm using right now works, and I, I take enough grief already over the flow hive plastics, and uh, Pierco and Acorn frames, and people think that those plastics are bad, but at least those can be recycled and they are stable, and my bees don't eat them. So that's, that's the other end of it. So thank you for those questions that were submitted. Uh, if you have questions yourself that you'd like to see addressed, I'm going to put one of these videos out every Friday or Saturday, and uh, write them down in the comments section below this video. And uh, at the very end of the video, of course, following this closing statement, you'll see that there are little tabs showing links to all of the other Frequently Asked Questions videos so that you can watch those. It's a playlist. You click on the first one and it will go through all of them if you have infinite patience. Thanks for watching. Submit your questions. And I look forward to talking to you again next week. I hope all of your bees are making it. Thanks for watching.